Welcome, friends. You're listening to Conversations with Consequences, the weekly podcast of the Catholic Association, where you get witty and charming conversation about the topics that matter to you with the leading thinkers of our time. Today, the leading thinkers are me, Dr. Gracie Christie, and my friend, the legal legal of the Catholic Association, Andrea Picciotti Bayer. Hello, Andrea. Hi, Gracie. <laughs> I actually don't think I'm leading thinker, but I, I agree that you are. And I'm really happy about what we're going to talk about, because I think that it is one of not only the leading thinkers, but the, a great voice for the church, um, especially in the U.S. here, that we're going to speak about. Okay, and she's talking about Bishop Barron. Andrea and I decided to do a podcast bonus episode on his Letter to a Suffering Church, a little book or booklet that he released a month or so ago, but um, it's really making the rounds. Lots of people are reading it, and we're very happy about that, because... We believe that it's making, it's, it has the potential to make a huge difference in the church's life going forward um, in, in face of the abuse crisis, which has been such a traumatic and ugly development, not only for the people directly affected, but for the rest of us Catholics who are so sad about everything that's happened and everything that it means. Well, one of the great things about Bishop Barron is he's definitely joy-filled. And this book, although tackling such a difficult, painful, embarrassing um, stain on the church, especially here in the U.S., um, ends with joy and with inspiration. And it struck me as a great opportunity to do a little bit of like a book report. We're starting school. Everyone's starting school. And all (laughs) Catholics should do a book report on this. They should read it. They should devour it. They should make notes in the side margins. They should underline. They should sit with it in front of the Blessed Sacrament and and f- try to ask of themselves, what is the Holy Spirit asking of me in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of this shame that affects all of us um, and plagues our ability to spread the gospel um, m- as effectively as the world needs it? Well, I've so personally, I've personally bought several copies and and I've also bought several in Spanish. So where I live in Miami and right now, Uh, We are right near the poor Bahamas that are being pummeled now for like day two by this catastrophic hurricane. Very sad. I hope all of you listeners will take a moment to say a little prayer for the poor Bahamians. Um, But anyway, we are um, right in the middle of Latin America here in Miami, and I've bought Mm -hmm. several copies in Spanish, and I've handed them out. You know, here where we live, we, we don't in a funny way, we don't think so much about the American church that is suffering, but we do think about a lot about the Latin American church and the same exact horrible scandals, the mm-hmm. same exact horrible pain that's plagued the church in the United States, has plagued the church everywhere else. And very much right now uh, in Chile, there is a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and a lot of people turning away from the church. A lot of people saying, you know, this is not the church that I can understand. This is not the church uh, where I'm safe and where my children are safe. And they're leaving the church. In fact, Bishop Barron gives us a horrible statistic. 37% of Catholics are considering leaving the church because of the sexual abuse crisis. Well, Andrea and I, we believe that this book can help. Again, it's called Letter to a Suffering Church. A Bishop Speaks on the Sexual Abuse Crisis by Bishop Robert Barron. Well, and Gracie, what I really, really loved about um, the little book, first, it's little. <laughs> I'm very happy. It's, it's, uh, like, 100, you know, it's 103, 103 pages, and, it's, and they're small pages. I know so people totally, can be challenged by a long book. No, but it's totally digestible for the everyday Catholic, mm-hmm. and, and not just the person in the pews, but the priests and the bishops. There is no one that should not have access to this book. It's not expensive. It's easy to find. It should be gifted, just like Gracie is planning on giving. And it's something that I think we need right now. Um, And you you touch upon something really um, important. There are a lot of people leaving or a lot of people that are just lukewarm, right? And Mm -hmm. some people are leaving in a huff and they're totally disgusted and they're making a show. And Bishop Barron centers us and I think grounds everyone and says, oh, now, (laughs) <laughs> we need to stay. We need to stay, and we need to fight. And, That's right. And the entire kind of theme throughout of this is, we're, and we're not fighting each other, and we're not um, trying to kind of self implode and and say who's who's holier and who's uh, more um, right 
on condemning. And we're not grasping yeah. for easy solutions either, right? Like institution, just institutional solutions. It's, it's a bigger problem than that. And the solution is deeper than that. Well, and I think the thing that's really great, maybe we can start off with the, um, the Wowza first chapter. Mm-hmm. And, and I really say Wowza because um, Bishop Barron doesn't hold back. That's right. Uh, so and chapter one. Identifies what, what it is. Why don't you tell everyone, Gracie, what, what the name of the chapter, the first chapter Yeah, is. so the first chapter is The Devil's Masterpiece. And Bishop Barron, he really makes it clear that when the devil decided to to attack the church exactly in this way, he was being brilliant, his usual brilliant self, because, um, as he says, it's so it seems so thoroughly thought through, so comprehensively intentional, um, that the the devil it has to be a personality behind this ex- ex- exact picking exactly what would hurt the most and what would cause the most distress and the most distrust and the most despair amongst the faithful. Well, and, and there's something really interesting. I think he, he touches upon it perfectly. There's been a lot of confusion recently about the nature of the enemy. Um, and, and the devil is a person, right? I mean, the devil is a fallen angel. And and Bishop Barron says the devil works typically through suggestion, insinuation, temptation, and seduction. He is essentially powerless until he finds men and women who will cooperate with him. And that's a really... That's a very um, good point. Super shocking, right? So mm-hmm. he's prowling about along with uh, tons of minions looking to take souls, looking to um, confuse, and he needs our collaboration. And sadly, uh, he's found collaboration, found collaboration among Many of our most trusted people within the church, right? Priests well, yes, and and, and, and when the, the and when the devil, uh, you know, priests stand in persona Christi to all of us, to the faithful, and when and and especially to children who who have who don't have the experience that that we have of of so many wonderful priests, so many priests that have for me, for instance. I, I don't have a single complaint of any priest in my life, and I've known so many, so many wonderful priests. I'm, I've been very, very fortunate. But these priests, priests stand in persona Christi to us and to a child. I've had some of my children misidentify the priest at the altar as God. This has happened to me many times <laughs> as the children were growing up. God said, I said, no, that's not God, that's the priest. But imagine the, the ingenuity, the terrible ingenuity of the devil to strike right there. Uh, in the in the in the place where we need the most trust, uh, which is our trust in God. Well, and you're absolutely right. The innocence of children and the openness is something that we're called to all be like, right? Mm-hmm. To be able to have that innocence and that connection with God. And and it, it struck me, one of the um, points that Bishop Barron makes in this tiny book is that relationship and that care and concern of children and special protection of children is something that we we read about in the Bible, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that anyone that abuses of children, um, wow, gosh. A like millstone. A millstone, a millstone <laughs> should be placed around their neck, right? Like and they should be thrown in the, in the oh, deepest water. Goodness. And, and, and that that connection, that childlike trust is our encounter with, we're able to encounter Christ through only the, through a childlike trust. Exactly. And, and, and if we break that, uh, either through abuse or suspicion, um, we're really kind of cutting off a great channel to, to connect with God. So at, at the end of the first chapter of Bishop Barron says, so many Catholics are understandably asking, why should I stay? Why not abandon this sinking ship before it drags me or my children under? So that's at the end of chapter one. But chapter two is where he gives us uh, light from the scriptures. So that's the name of the chapter, Light from the Scriptures. And um, he is able to, in a very short chapter, he's able to place this this terrible uh, scourge of sexual abuse. He's able to place it uh, within the scriptural, this long scriptural narrative that we have where God, um, in his dealings with the people of Israel, he... He, he tells the people of Israel what the true nature of sexuality is, where sexuality belongs, how sexuality is holy, and, um, and how it's not. And how when mm-hmm. sexuality goes wrong, it goes terribly, terribly wrong. And how that is so inimical 
to the way that God wants for us to live. Well, it's very easy when we think about the world around us, right? One of the biggest challenges to, is to see that the world around us has such a m- misunderstanding right now of of human sexuality, right? Everything seems to be turned on its head, even just in our generation, Gracie, you and I. Things that normally were considered aberration are now the completely norm, normalized. Exactly. Right? So, yeah. So we we live in a world that's that's um, turned inside out uh, and upside down uh, as far as human sexuality. And the church continues to give clear direction in in its message and its teaching. And unfortunately, this crisis has said, in our practice, are we living it? Mm-hmm. And and have our, our spiritual leaders been living it, but also ourselves. I think there's something, you know, it gives a chance to pause. It's very easy to point fingers at someone <laughs> and, and talk about their failings. But also, it, this is an opportunity to think, are we living purity? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and is our understanding and our appreciation of the sexual gift given by God one that we're respecting and, and passing on? And it's very helpful to read from Bishop Barron how these things are are completely, they're so old. They're as old yeah. as humanity, right? These, these cra- these, this lack of understanding of the sexual gift, of the holiness of the sexual gift, of where it belongs and how it can be made, dign- how it is supposed to be dignified and full of grace uh, and fruitful and, and c- uh, all the wonderful things that sex is. Instead, man from the very beginning has been able, has sadly, been able to turn it on its head and completely do the opposite of what God intends for human sexuality. So he places, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and his and his poor daughters. Then he goes on to Eli and his sons. And what else does he talk about? Oh, of course, David and Bathsheba, <laughs> which is so sad, such a sad story. I mean, a man that was King David, the, the the beloved one of the Lord, right, Who's, who danced before the ark, to fall so low as to send Bathsheba's husband to his own to mm-hmm. to, to murder Bathsheba's husband so that he could have that sexual pleasure with with Bathsheba. So he, as uh, Pope uh, Bishop Barron says, David stands here as an icon of the abuse of power, just as well, and, uh, is happening and, today. And I think it, it gives us a chance to remember. The power of the Old Testament. I don't know about you. I, I tend to spend, you know, my daily reading of the Bible. I, I always gravitate towards the New Testament, and I forget that the Old Testament is part of this continuation that God has guided us humanity through. Absolutely, and, yeah. and it's a great reminder um, that the importance of Scripture to kind of give us signposts on where we're supposed to go individually in our own lives and and as a community of believers and and see that there are people who have gotten lost along the way Mm -hmm. it's not comforting (laughs) it's not comforting but it it makes our present struggles a little easier to understand maybe a little easier to bear right well we, we have to pay more attention if the people who have come before us have fallen we, it's like, you know, fool me once, shame on, on you, fool me twice, shame on me. We can't fool, we fooled. We can't be fooled uh, by the enemy in, in these games that mm-hmm. he's, he's uh, inviting us to play in. The, um, right, because the, it starts with unchastity, it starts with the pursuit of pleasure, but it ends in terrible abuse. It always ends in abuse. When you take sex out of its safe spot in matrimony, it turns, it's always abuse. In my, in my opinion... Sex outside of marriage is always a form of abuse. What's really interesting as we go through this book, um, when we talk about we've been there before, is is actually the the title of the third chapter, and it talks not only you know the continuation of the scriptural um, failings of man, but of the church, and um, and it's I think he's doing it not to downplay our problems, but to encourage us to know that. The church isn't disappearing. Mm-hmm. We're not falling apart. Um, and what we we've come this to far, is, we're going to go further. And we need to stay faithful. We need to stay faithful. And that's that's. Um, I guess the thing that I most enjoyed about the book is don't leave, stay, stay and fight. Um, and and can I read? Away. Can I read a couple of quotes from this chapter? They're they're not quotes from Bishop Barron. They're quotes from favorites of Bishop Barron, but they're also my favorites. So he's, uh, let's see, um, 
John Henry Newman, who will be canonized in October, who po Bishop Barron calls one of the most perceptive theological minds in the tradition, made this observation. The whole course of Christianity is but one series of troubles and disorders. Every century is like every other, and to those who live in it, seems worse than all times before it. The church is ever ailing. Religion seems ever expiring. Schisms dominant, the light of truth dim, its adherents scattered. The cause of Christ is ever in its last agony. Is that wonderful? <laughs> it's amazing how we're able to like exaggerate everything. Calm down. Stay where we are. Always in its last everything agony. Will be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are. You know, we are a people. The Christ Christians. We are a people of ex of who live in extremes. We live. We live in an extremely broken world, and we have been given an extremely beautiful and difficult to implement um, pastoral job. <laughs> right. It's very difficult to implement what's been handed to us. The, the, the gospel is very difficult. So we are a people who live in extremes. But what's really, really great is we're exactly in the right place. We're exactly where we need to be in the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of, of the storm. We're in the right boat. We're in the boat that never sinks. And we have to stay there. And, and I really appreciate um, the reasons why we have to stay. The reasons why we can't jump ship and just kind of think that we're going to be fine someplace else and we're going to... Okay, but you're going to chapter... I love to jump ahead. You're jumping to chapter four. Are you done with chapter three? <laughs> I am because, you know, I think that it's very easy to get stuck there. And, and, you know, a lot of people read like half a book. And what I really want to make sure is that everyone reads to the end of this book. Okay, but I did find chapter three very encouraging. Very encouraging. Because well. the story, some of the stories in chapter three, he gives, so he gives the stories in chapter three, starting from the first days of the apostles, the act from the acts of the apostles of, of human sexuality gone terribly wrong. And there have been times in the history of the church where the rot was so intense that it makes the current situation seem uh, something that we can definitely overcome as a church, as an institution, as a holy and divine institution. Mm hmm so anyway, no. I like. I happen to like chapter three. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I okay. just want to get to the 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 the, the inspirational messages. No, of, no, no. Of why we can't find? No, no. And you're absolutely right, Andrea, so, because chapter so. four is why should we stay? And this is obviously the most important thing. Why should we stay? You know, it's very easy. Sometimes, um, especially as we get older, we always think back to like how things were so much better before. Um, and, and this lead in really shows how things have always been um, in turmoil. But when we stay where God has put us, when we bring more people to his church, we will find tranquility. And, and one of the kind of first dimensions, as he, he mentions it, that Bishop Barron meant, uh, speaks about the church is the church speaks of God. Mm -hmm. And and we hear we are surrounded by noise, right? We're surrounded by so many um, kind of new models and a new iPhone is out and think about getting thinner and faster and you can be prettier. And very rarely do we even hear about um, God. And, and in the church, we can trust that we're going to hear of God. And Bishop and Barron, I, I, I Bishop Barron reminds us that it is only uh, when we are plugged into God, when we are oriented towards God, that we have peace and that we have tranquility and an understanding of our own lives. He says, let's see. Well, for instance, he says, certainly one of the reasons for the chronic depression that seems to bedevil so many people today is the loss of a transcendent point of reference. How true is that? People mm -hmm. don't know who they are. They don't know why they are walking around in, on the world. The material things that they're told are going to satisfy them and bring them happiness simply do not. And there's a lot of sadness in the world, a lot of loneliness, and it's that transcendent point of view, the knowing that we are children of a beloved God, of a, of a mm -hmm. loving God, that can, the on, that's the only thing that can give us the satisfaction and tranquility that will make our days on earth here uh, livable. Well, and he uses a beautiful phrase, the hungry heart. Mm. The only, you know, stay with the church because at its best, it properly orients the hungry heart. And I know that, that we all feel that. I, I feel it every time I'm in uh, before the tabernacle, it's it's there's this 
yearning for oneness um, with Christ and and in his church you find that unity and the other the other thing that he uh, Bishop Banner mentions is um, the church being the mystical body of of Christ not just and, another just Jesus is not one more prophet among many as he says right he's not simply a spokesperson for God he is God from God light from light true God from true God well, and he says to something beautiful, and it's very easy as we think, especially Americans. Um, he mentions the church is an organism, not an organization. Mm, that's a good one. That's a good line. And it's very important to understand each of its members. We all have different charisms and different strengths and different injuries and different defects. Uh, but at the same time, we're part of the mystical body of Christ. And he points, Bishop Aaron points in this chapter to the fact that Jesus is not, uh, he's not one prophet among many. He's not one hero among many. And his, the, the difference in Jesus is that he rose from the dead. And on that third day after his death, when he defeats death and, and the resurrection happens, that's when he becomes, that's when he becomes salvation. He is salvation. He is the truth and the light and the way. And he is unlike any other figure in the human imagination and, and mm-hmm. because he does do that, that great feat. So to walk away from the church is to walk away from, from that. You can't well, replace it with a yoga class. To, no. <laughs> you can't replace it with, with another religion or some other form of, reli- of Christian religion that doesn't have that, that connection to the mystical body of Christ who feeds us in the Eucharist every week. Well, there's a great reminder, too, and I think we often, as Catholics, forget the power of the Holy Spirit, and uh, the book reminds us of the Holy Spirit and the the kind of energizing and revitalizing role of the Holy Spirit within the church. And and it's a great reminder. We we have a gift that oftentimes we don't call upon um, to direct us, to orient us, to encourage us. And at the same time, we have, you know, the triune God. Mm-hmm. And God the Father. And right now, I think we all feel like injured children. And and we haven't been abandoned. We have a loving Father who's there, who's patiently waiting for us to ask for forgiveness and to make a, a return to Him. And the church also gives us the sacraments, which are... <laughs> which are awesome. <laughs> which are awesome. <laughs> and they are, they are invaluable sources of grace. I know I personally have a couple people that are close to me that have fallen away from the church and have been that then that falling away has been accelerated by the abuse crisis by the lack of trust that they have in the church especially in the prelates I think I think that they're satisfied that the priests that they have known are good men but they're not satisfied that these prelates that they've never met the archbishops maybe and the bishops that they will never meet that they can trust them to keep their children safe uh, because we've seen that they haven't done it right that there has been so many sad instances no, of that. And, but and I tell, yeah, affair. terrible, terrible. But I tell my these two or three people that I know, I say, but if you leave the church, you leave the sacraments. And you can go somewhere else and you can listen to wonderful homilies and you can read the, the Bible on your own and, and go pray and you can do all these wonderful things and those are all fabulous, but you won't have the sacraments. Well, and, and primary among all of the sacraments, right, is, is the Eucharist. And, and Bishop Barron makes a point, the Eucharist is the single most important reason for staying faithful to the church. Jesus is our friend. He mm-hmm. has never betrayed us. He has never tricked us. He has never lied to us. And even though our brothers and sisters may have their own error, Christ has never, never left us. Yeah, and, and with and with side. the grace that we get from the sacraments, from the Holy Spirit, then we're able to achieve, we can at least try, we can hope to achieve holiness, the holiness that each of us are called for in the midst of our ordinary lives. The great thing that I also think is, is something special about the Catholic Church is the role of the saints, and it's um, the saints of the past and the saints of... Uh, currently amongst us. Mm -hmm. I I can point to people that I know who are living such great holy lives, who are exemplars uh, as Catholics and are really taking all the grace that they have personally and putting into play 
whether it be in their homes or in their work or both. And um, that's kind of the way forward, right? Our last chapter, chapter five, the way forward. What are we to do all of this? And, and Bishop Barron outlined some really important points. Some of them are, are institutional reform points that are very, That's the very first important. one. And he, and he makes a big point of that. And I think that uh, we need to stop and, and consider that, yes, uh, the, church has come a, the church has come a very long way. The church right now is the safest place a child can be right now is in church. It's not in a public school situation. It's not at soccer camp. And the church has, has you know, since 2002 has implemented, you know, various things. But Bishop Barron does go through them in Chapter 5 of all the ways that the church as an institution has made sure that children can be as safe as possible. Well, and the, and the the reforms kind of adopted by the Dallas Charter are very important. Mm-hmm. He does specifically mention, I think, Gracie, you, knew, you and I both agree, that it's important that we get to the bottom of things with Mr. McCarrick. Um, yeah. Who knew, who, who should have stopped things uh, earlier? Who, why did why did he uh, kind of why did he uh, find himself elevated? Yeah, why did he ranks? keep rising when everybody yeah. knew he was He's a complete a perv? Man. Yeah, yeah, very, very bad man. But then we get to the last point, and that's um, kind of the most important point that lends itself to, to profound meditation, I think, from all Catholics. And that's renewal, right? Yeah, Two kinds and, of renewal. Bishop yes. Barron separates the renewal. He says renewal of the priesthood, first of all, because there's some serious rot in the priesthood. Ooh, yeah. Because the Catholic Church, the priests in the Catholic Church have exhibited about the same level of sexual perversion as men in the general population. Yeah, and we should shoot for better. We should be, our priests should be much, much better. So he yeah. does, Father B- Bishop Barron does not pull punches on this. He, he, mm-hmm. he, you know, he says that straight on. So it could be that the moral relativism that's all around our, in our culture, that's poisoning our culture, has poisoned the seminaries and has poisoned the young priests' minds as well, and the older priests, unfortunately. But well, and I think it seeps into our homes, and that's that second point. And then of, the second point: how how do we live? What what else is needed? It's it's needed a general renewal of homes. of the laity, and that's and us. That, and that's you know not just in our own lives, kind of cabined into how I'm going to live my own life, but it spills over into our home, mm-hmm. into our friendships, our schools, our neighborhoods. Every opportunity that we have needs to be an infusion of holiness, of kind of returning back with a... Because, kind of because Bishop Barron says to us, okay, first of all, priests come from Catholic families and are shaped by the lay culture of our, of our homes and our families. And he reminds us, 75% of us Catholics do not go to Mass regularly. Mm-hmm. And if you poll Catholics in general on their moral opinions, even on sexual topics, we... We track with the rest of the general population. This is a very, very terrible thing. It, it tells us that it's not enough to say, oh, the church must be better, the church must be better. We are the church. Yeah. We have to have higher, nobler ideas and values than the rest of the population. Much higher, much nobler. Well, and, and we, we've spoken, you and I, about this before, Gracie. Light attracts, right? We're attracted to the light of Christ. Mm-hmm. And if we have that light within us, other people who are living in in darkness in this world that's so confusing and so sad and so empty, if they see in us the light of Christ, they will come to it and then light will shine even brighter. And And I think that was one of the most inspiring parts of the book for me. This isn't just about the church. This is this about isn't us. Just about her. This is this isn't mm-hmm. this is about the world right now. Right now, God is asking something greater of the church and of each one of its members. That's and right. And that's to to kind of be the light of Christ here and help to sanctify and convert the world, which is really a disaster. I think we can sum it up like this: Fight that things may be done right in the church, but first fight for your own holiness. Mm-hmm. And with, that, and with that, we have come to the end of Bishop Barron's wonderful little book, Letter to a Suffering Church. We hope, listeners, that you have enjoyed this. We hope that it inspires you to click on the link of the podcast. It will take you to a place where you can buy the little book. Uh, you can also download it. I think it's on Kindle now. 
you can uh, write. I think you did. Didn't you download yeah. it on Kindle, Andrea? I'm Actually, pretty sure. I went Amazon. I need to get that book. <laughs> but I think you can get it on Kindle. You can uh, you can order it from Amazon. Do order several well, copies. Can, like give it to all your friends. It it's your very kids. inexpensive. Um, and yeah, buy a bunch. Give them to your kids, to your friends, to people in church you see struggling, to a neighbor that you notice stop going to church. This is this yeah. is the time when we can all. Yeah, we stay and fight. We help each other, and we help each other with our holiness. Right? Make make help make your husband more holy, or your wife, your sister. Infuse your home with with the certainty that God's uh, God's desires for us, His laws for us, are what make us happy. What will eventually make us very very happy. <laughs> all in heaven. <laughs> Well, you've been listening. People there as possible along with us. That's right. We never go alone to heaven. So you've been listening to Conversations with Consequences. This has been a special podcast episode on a letter to a suffering church from Bishop Robert Barron. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast at thecatholicassociation.org slash podcast. It's for free wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you, Andrea Picciotti Bear, Legal Legal of the Catholic Association, for joining me today. And I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. And we will be hearing from you soon, I'm sure. <laughs>